Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal, to horrifying history, to tense and terrible true crime, and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda, and I'm Lindsay, and we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey, everyone. Today, we're going to be talking about the Moore's murders. And this case actually was a recommendation of one of our patrons, Chloe. So thank you. Thank you, Chloe. Our topic today involves murders against children. If you've been creeping with us for a minute, you know that when we talk about any type of violence against children, we're, we're a bit less silly. The episodes are more serious. Not to say that there won't be breaks here and there for some levity for our own sake. We did plenty of chatting before we started recording today because we got our warp Tour tickets and then we're planning our second spooky trip, which is going to happen next year. And we'll tell you all about that when we tell you all about that. Again, today's case is with children. So if that's not something you want to hear, you might want to skip today's episode. The judge that was overseeing this criminal trial described the murders as, quote, two sadistic killers of the utmost depravity. And the murders themselves took place in Manchester, England. To tell the story of this case, we're going to start with the killer's histories, what happened once their lives converged, and then about the murders. As always, we will discuss each victim and we will share as much information as we possibly could find about them. These happened decades ago, so some of the information is hard to come by. The victims of the Moore murders were Pauline Reed, John Kilbride, Keith Bennett, Leslie Ann Downey, and Edward Evans. So the first person we're going to discuss is one of the murderers, and his name is Ian Brady. Now, Ian Brady was born on January 2nd of 1938 in Glasgow. His original last name was Duncan, but when he was in his late teens, he took his stepfather's last name, which was Brady. There were accusations that Brady, like many other serial killers, abused animals. One instance is that he bragged about killing a cat when he was just 10, which is fucking awful. There's also reports that he burned a cat alive, decapitated rabbits, and would stone dogs. I don't even know what I would do if I caught a kid doing that. I have no idea. If you see a kid hurting other things, something's wrong. Yes, yes. That's not normal kid behavior. No. But what do you do? Most serial killer stories where you know like a lot about the killer, there's always stories about what they were doing to animals when they were kids. Mm -hmm. I don't know what I would do if I saw a kid do that. Because it's like, Mm -mm. oh, no, what will you become? Or is it fixable? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've yelled at neighbor kids for taking toads and dropping them. Like, I can't imagine someone actually, like, doing something with malicious intent, you know? Yeah. Brady asserted that the allegations of animal abuse were absolutely false, which we know better, right? He left school at 15, and he worked at a shipyard. Then afterwards, he ended up working for a butcher. During his teenage years, he got into trouble with the law a good amount of the time. Twice he appeared in juvenile court for breaking into homes. He appeared in court for threatening his then-girlfriend, Evelyn Grant, with a knife because she danced with another boy. Get fucked. He also stole a bag of lead seals. He received a two-year sentence for the theft and the threat to his ex-girlfriend. By the time he got out, in November of 1957, he was almost 20 years old. Brady worked in a job that included manual labor, then at a brewery where he was eventually fired. He decided to learn how to be a bookkeeper and spent hours studying in his room with a set of instruction manuals from a local library. Brady got a clerical job at Millward's Merchandising, which was a wholesale chemical distribution company in Gorton. During this time, he rode a Tiger Cub motorcycle and seemed too interested in Germany and Nazis. Never a good sign. Never a good sign. Brady met Myra at Millward's. So we're going to talk about Myra for a bit then talk about what happened once they got together. Myra Henley was born on July 23rd of 1942 in Crumsall. And her father, Bob, was known to be an alcoholic and just a relatively like tough guy. And from what we saw, it seemed like he expected Henley to be tough too. And I just think that's interesting because we're talking about like the 1950s and that seems pretty at odds with how most people were raising women. It was normally like, oh, you want delicate lady like behavior in the 1950s. But in one instance, when Henley was just eight years old, she ran to her dad crying because a boy scratched her in her cheeks. And he did it so hard that he drew blood. And from the story that we saw, Bob told Henley that she had to retaliate 
and told her that if she didn't go retaliate against the boy who scratched her, that he would leather her if she didn't, which we are assuming means hit her with a belt. Yeah. So Henley did retaliate. She went after the boy and knocked him down after punching him several times. When she wrote about this later, she would talk about this as her first win. The first job that Henley ever had was at a local electrical engineering firm where she was a junior clerk. And she also took judo lessons each week, but found that people were a bit reluctant to spar with her because she got a reputation for being unnecessarily slow when she would release her grip on people. Not a good sign. Unsettling. Yeah. Henley began working at Millward's as a typist in January of 61. And that's where she met Brady. She became obsessed with him quickly. But she didn't really talk to him until July of 1961. So more than half a year after she had started working there. Bizarre. Yeah. So Henley's diary entries go into detail about how fascinated and enamored she was by him. Henley and Brady's first date was in December of 1961. And they went to the movies. Many of their dates were them going to the movies, then going back to Henley's house where they would drink German wine together. Some sources say that they went to see X-rated films, which are not what we think of today as X-rated films. They're more like NC-17 or rated R movies today. Mm -hmm. Rated X just meant that no one under 16 could be in the theater. When I read that, I was like, oh, and I was like, oh, no, no, it's not that. It sounds more intense. Yeah, no, it's just like a (laughs) rated R movie. Yeah. But not surprisingly, things got pretty weird with them pretty fast. Part of the routine that they developed would be that Brady would give Hinley books to read, which like, okay, that's not so weird. No. But they began reading accounts of Nazi atrocities to each other out loud. That's weird. And to make it worse, they were doing this during their lunch breaks, which like, I can't imagine being in that break room being like, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to fucking eat my sandwich over here. Can you fucking not? Right. It's one thing to be talking about current events. It's another thing to be like, let's talk about the fucking worst of the worst every day during our break. Keep in mind, this is less than 20 years after World War II ended. So it's it's still like fresh, fresh. So little by little, Hinley then began to change her appearance so she would fit more Aryan beauty ideals. She started wearing bright lipstick. She bleached her hair. And she also started to change her style, too. She began to wear more risque stuff, which was like short skirts and leather jackets with high boots, which like today, not so big of a deal. But then that was a big deal. We're talking about the 60s, a stark change from who she was. Yeah. It seems Kinley knew that there was something off about Brady pretty early into their relationship Because he drugged her. She wrote a letter to a friend about the incident. But in the same letter, she was very clear that her infatuation continued despite him drugging her. And in the letter, she like very clearly discusses the instance of him drugging her. Now, several months after this letter, she reaches out to her friend and begs her to destroy the letter. But from my understanding, she did not. Which I also would not if a friend was like, here's a horrible thing my partner did to me. Yeah. Please destroy the letter. I'll be like, I, yeah, I'm going to totally destroy that. Yeah, it's totally gone. Right. I didn't like keep it. Put it in a safe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Fucking put it in a safety deposit box. No. Keeping it for, especially because now you've asked me to destroy it. Things are super sketch. Yes. So Hindley began going to local shooting ranges. One of the friends that she met through this was George Clitheroe. George was the president of the Cheadle Rifle Club. He helped Hindley buy a 22 rifle. However, George did thwart her attempts at joining the pistol club, which is weird. He's helping her buy a gun, and he's like, no, don't join this. Nevertheless, she was able to purchase two pistols from the people that were in the pistol club. During this time, Hindley would also rent vans because she and Brady had a very weird hobby, and that was planning bank robberies. Fucking weird. Right? Like, that. that's strange. Like, to go to the point where you're going to rent a van, but, like, they never went through with it. So, bizarre. Strange hobby. So the pair then began getting really interested in photography. And Brady already had a camera. It was a box brownie, to be exact, which we talked about some of these cameras last week. Mm -hmm. And it is one that I actually own, by the way. He upgraded to a better model, and he ended up getting more equipment. So he bought lights and materials to develop his own film. So a lot of stuff that he needed to do this. Hindley was relatively modest before this. And the pair began taking photos that, at the time, would have been considered explicit. At this time, Hindley was living with her grandmother, and that was on Bannock Street in Gorton. Brady moved in with them in June of 1963. So it was her, her grandmother, and then Brady joined them. Mm -hmm. On July 12th of 1963, 
Brady and Henley murdered their first victim, and that was Pauline Reed. Now, a little bit about Pauline. Pauline was born on February 18th of 1947 to Amos and Joan Reed. When she was 15, she left school so that she could work with her father, and that was at Sharple's Bakery. Pauline was close to her brother, whose name was Paul, and he was just a year younger than her. She was Catholic and also very deeply religious. She loved dancing, music, as well as writing songs and poems. She was really cute. I'm not good at those things. Her family said that she had a great sense of humor. Seven months before her murder, Pauline was one of the three winners of a Christmas baking competition. And her photo appeared in the Gordon Reporter. So she was like celebrating and everyone was so proud of her. Mm -hmm. She obviously, she won that contest. She was a talented baker, which I love. Yeah. So her niece, Jackie, who unfortunately never got to meet her, she actually kept one of her cookbooks. And inside of it, Pauline wrote, this book belongs to Pauline Reed. If this book gets lost, smack its bum and send it home crying. <laughs> I love that. That's so funny. It's very, it's, it's very cute. I also, I feel like you get an idea of her humor. Yes, yes. And it's cute that they called it, you know, a cookbook. Like it was her like recipe book. Adorable. Mm -hmm. Yes. One of her best friends, Pat Cummings, described her as being shy and said that she typically wouldn't get in a car of a stranger. On the evening that Pauline was murdered, the girls were planning on going to the dance with friends. But one of the parents of the friends found out that there's going to be alcohol there. So a lot of the parents were like, no, 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 you can't go anymore. Which like seems fair. Especially we're talking 1960s. Exactly. Yeah. They're like, please don't go out and do bad things. So Pauline's mother, Joan, didn't love the idea of her going out on her own, but she knew how excited Pauline was and that she could trust her daughter to make it home before curfew. So she's like, I know she's a good girl. She's going to make good choices. Okay. I understand that there's going to be things that I don't love there, but you can go. Yes. In an interview after her death, Joan told a reporter that right before Pauline left, she put a necklace on Pauline and watched her as she walked around the corner outside. So she was walking to the dance. That breaks my heart. Heartbreaking. When we were reading that, I believe it was like one of the mother's like favorite necklaces too. And and Pauline was like, mom. And it was like this very like special moment between the two of them, which not that you ever want to have a last moment with your child, but I'm glad it was a positive and, and sweet moment. Yeah, yeah. It was a good thing, not like an argument or something that they'd regret. So it ended up that two of her friends were still able to go to the dance and they planned on surprising her because at first their parents are like, no, but then they probably did the same thing and talked them into it, right? Yes. So they saw her walking and they really wanted to, you know, surprise her. So they took a shortcut. And what they plan on doing is kind of coming up to her like when they were closer to the dance and surprising her and making her excited that everyone else still got to go too. When they didn't see her again, they assumed that she decided not to go to the dance and possibly turned around. One of her friends said later she had nightmares for years about seeing Pauline walking by herself for the last time. So Pauline never made it to that dance. She was just 16 when she was murdered. Fucking awful. Terrible. So let's get into Pauline's murder. Early on the day of her murder, which was July 12th of 1963, Henley reported that Brady told her that he wanted to commit the perfect murder. So after they got off work, Henley drove in the van and Brady drove behind her on his motorcycle. And he would signal to Henley when he saw a potential victim by flashing his headlights. Ugh, terrifying. Yes. I mean, truly fucking horrifying. Weird to use someone else's van to do bad things. Yeah, I, I would say bizarre. But also we're talking before DNA. Yeah, that's true. Was in like a known thing. So now I'm like... <laughs> It feels like framing someone if, if you were to use somebody else's vehicle. Yeah. Or like that they would be like, uh, yeah, Lindsay borrowed this. Right. But this is before people would even have that, you know, concept. So one of the first victims Brady flashes lights for to get Henley to stop. Henley refused to stop for. And that was because that potential victim was one of her mother's neighbors and was just eight years old. So it was after 7.30 p.m. when Henley stopped and asked Pauline if she needed a ride. And again, Pauline was on her way to the dance. And Henley has given conflicting statements as to, as to whether it was her or Brady that selected Pauline as their first victim. She did, however, say that she believed that there would be more attention given to a young child's disappearance than a teenager's, which still rings true today. 
a teenage girl goes missing and police are like, she ran away, Mm -hmm. which will never make sense to me because no absent abuse or a substance addiction. I just don't think a teenage child is is going to say, you know, I would like to start all over with no documents and no money. It's just not a fucking thing that makes any sense. No. We, We know some of what happened because the killers described what happened. So Hinley asked Pauline if she would help her find an expensive glove that she had lost at Saddlewood Moor. When you think English countryside, you're thinking of a moor with rolling hills and there's some water features and trees. It's lovely. It's like generally just beautiful. So she's like, I was there. I dropped one of my gloves. It was super expensive. Could you help me find it? Pauline, being the nice young lady that she is, is like, yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll go help you find your glove, even though I'm on the way to the dance and I'm really close to it. So Henley and Pauline got to Saddleworth more, and then Brady showed up. Henley told Pauline that he was going to help them look for the glove. But then Brady and Henley went, you know, and we started to walk around the moor to look for that glove. And that's when she was murdered. The cuts to Pauline's neck were so bad that she was nearly decapitated. Henley claimed that she stayed in the van until Brady came back and got her, which was about a half hour after they arrived. And that he then took Henley to where Pauline was laying, dying, and her clothes were in just a complete disarray. And per Henley, she asked Brady whether he raped Pauline, to which he responded, of course I did. Ugh. Fuck. The worst of the worst. The worst of the fucking worst. Brady then went to go get a shovel that he had hidden someplace in the moor so that he could bury Pauline. And he'd hidden that shovel on a previous visit. So this is clearly something he was planning, planning, because it's not even like he just had it in the van. Yeah. When Brady recounted what happened, he said that Hinley was present for the murder and that she also participated in Pauline's sexual assault. Ugh. Now, Pauline actually went to school with Hinley's sister, Maureen. And so it's interesting that there's a connection there. Yeah. At the time of her murder, Pauline was dating a boy named David Smith. And Smith had already been convicted of three minor crimes. So police looked to him as their initial suspect, but he was cleared. And after that, they they had a really hard time getting any leads because no one had seen Pauline right before she disappeared other than her friends walking. So nobody saw her get into that van or saw that she was with them. Yeah. She just disappeared. That's scary. Mm -hmm. And how quick something can happen, you know, minutes. Yes. As you mentioned earlier, you know, she had that friend that saw her, you know, walking and was like, okay, I'll catch her at the next block or what have you. Yeah. And then she's just gone. It stresses me out, like how quick things happen. So fucking quick. So then on November 23rd of 1963, Brady and Hidley murdered John Kilbride. And of course, we're going to talk about John. So a little bit about him. John's parents were Sheila and Patrick, and his siblings were Patrick Jr., Terry, Sheila Jr., Maria and Christopher. So big family. I love a lady junior. I fucking love a lady junior. You've said it before, too. You do. I've said it before. We don't have enough lady juniors. Cute, though. Like big family. Love the names. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When talking about John, Terry said that all his siblings looked up to him. John went to his grandmother's house every day to check in on her and see if she needed any help. So just a good, sweet boy. Right before his murder, John had just been picked to be on the football team and was often overheard whistling. I love intricate details about the people that we talk about, too, like to really humanize them, right? Like they're not just a victim. They were yeah, a boy who loved football and loved to whistle. Like it, it's so sad. Yes. I want to picture John walking down the street whistling on his way to go visit his grandmother. Not the worst thing that ever happened to him. Yeah. That's what I want to think of. And it just... It makes it more real. Yeah. We talk about true crime a lot. And so often we just don't, we don't have this full picture of the victims and we don't want people to ever to just be the worst thing that ever happened to them. Yes, exactly. John was also described as being adventurous and very trusting. John was just 12 on the day of his murder. Earlier that day, he had done some shopping for his grandmother. Again, good sweet boy. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, some of his friends had asked him to go to the movies. So typical 12-year-old, right? Sheila urged John to keep an eye out because of Pauline's recent disappearance. And I can't even wrap my head around knowing that something bad just happened, warning your kid about it, and then them being part of it. It like, ugh, it, it turns my stomach. I think it's important to note that we are also 
very much before the stranger danger era Mm -hmm. that really doesn't happen until we get to the 70s and 80s. People aren't really thinking about how people are hurting kids as a thing that happens that often. Not that it doesn't happen. And there's obviously like fables and folklore and beliefs and things, but it's typically somebody who's like evil, not somebody who lives in the neighborhood. Yeah. During the trial, one of John's friends, also named John, recounted that they were at the movies, then went to one of the markets to do odd jobs. So his friend separated from John at one point, and unfortunately, they never saw him again. So same thing, like in a matter of minutes, was just gone. Yes. So what happened is in the early evening of November 23rd, Brady and Hinley offered John a ride home. They had met him in the market, and they had promised that they would give him a bottle of sherry. Once they got into the van, Brady then suggested a series of detours. The first would be to go to their home and get the bottle of sherry. But first, they needed to stop at Saddleworth Moor to look for Hinley's missing glove all over again. Mm -hmm. Hinley waited in the van at Saddleworth while Brady took John into the moor. Brady sexually assaulted John, then attempted to cut his throat, but was unsuccessful. He then used a shoelace to strangle John and buried him in a shallow grave. Hinley and Brady later returned with Hinley's dog, named Puppet, and Brady photographed Hinley and Puppet standing on the shallow grave. Fucked. So fucked. Ugh. So then the following year, on June 16th of 1964, Hinley and Brady murdered Keith Bennett. So let's talk a little bit about Keith. A few days before his death, Keith turned 12, and he spent his 12th birthday with his family, who included his mother, Winnie Johnson, who was very pregnant. We're going to talk a lot about her later in the episode. His stepfather, Jimmy Johnson, his younger sisters, Margaret, Susan, and Sylvia, and his younger brothers, Ian and Alan. So again, another big family. Yeah. Keith was four and a half feet tall and had glasses that he was nearly blind without. Most everyone described him as a good and pleasant kid who was often daydreaming. And that night, he was headed to spend the night at his grandmother's house. He was just a few blocks away from his grandmother's house when he went missing. He never shows up. So the next morning, his grandmother comes to the house and is like, hey, where's Keith? And she assumed that he had changed his mind about coming over and didn't call. Yeah. This is in a time period and place where a lot of people didn't have phones in their homes. So neither the parents nor the grandmother had phones. That makes sense. So they couldn't just call. And he was just 12. So, you know, he gets there and that's when the parents are like, what do you mean he never got there? I can't imagine like the pit in your stomach, you know, the moment the grandmother came over and was like, he never made it. And you're thinking he's safe at at grandma's house, right? Yes, yes. And again, it's that time period before like walking down the street wasn't safe. And even when you think about that, my parents' generation, which was like, be home before the streetlights come on. Mm -hmm. And then there was our generation where it was like, okay, you can walk this distance by yourself, where kids would walk to school by themselves and were relatively independent. Now it's, I'm keeping my eyes on you. Like, I have eyes on you. Yeah. Unless you are with another adult who I trust Mm -hmm. and they have eyes on you. Yeah. But there are adult eyes on you most of the time if you're out in the world. It's sad that we've come to that. Yeah, my kid's not allowed to play outside in front without me. It's just, I don't trust anyone. It's awful. But back to Keith. In the early evening of June 16th, Hinley asked Keith if he could help her load some boxes into her van. And she said that once he was finished helping her, she would give him a lift home. So Brady was in the back of the van when Keith got in. Again, Hinley asked Keith if he could help her find a lost glove. So the three headed to Saddleworth. When they got there, Keith went off with Brady to go look for that glove. About a half hour later, he comes back. Again, he has that fucking shovel. Hinley asked him what he had done, and he told her that he sexually assaulted him and then strangled him with the string. Ugh, hate it. And so we're going to switch gears a little bit and take a pause from talking about victims because there's some other, I don't want to say ancillary people, but they're they're related people who kind of are in the universe of what's happening. And you need to know about this part to be able to understand the connection between folks. Correct. Yes. So then on August 15th of 1964, Hinley's sister, Maureen, we talked about her, married David Smith when she was seven months pregnant. And we also mentioned David Smith before because he was the one that was dating Pauline when she was murdered. Now, Maureen and David's wedding was performed at the register office with none of her family in attendance. Maureen and Smith then moved into Smith's father's home, and the next day they decided to take a trip to Windermere. It's on this trip that Smith meets Brady for the first time. 
They were big fans of one another. They got along great. They chatted about so many things, but some of the notable topics included how wealth was distributed, society, robbing banks, again, a favorite of theirs for some reason, and, you know, the typical get-to-know-you topics. Fucking wild. The first time you meet somebody and you're like, let's talk about crimes. Now, it's one thing to be like, here are the cases I'm involved with, because once you've got a hyperfixation, you've got a hyperfixation. Mm -hmm. But I feel like this is a heavy first meeting conversation. Right? Like, my one of my favorite things to do is to go rent vans and plan robbing banks. What about you? You know, like... Yeah, yeah. Fucking weird. Smith and Brady started getting real chummy. And some sources report that Hindley got jealous of their blossoming relationship. But she also was able to get closer to her sister because the couples began to hang out more. Also in 1964, Hindley and her grandmother, plus Brady, remember, he moved in, they all moved to Wardle Brook Avenue near Hyde. A young girl in the area named Patricia Hodges, who lived a few doors down from them, began to hang around them as well. She was just 11, so that's a little odd. And they never harmed her because she lived too close to them. I just find it very peculiar, the idea of adults hanging around children when they don't have children. Yes. Now, I say that with a person who is married to a child magnet. Like, children love Ben. <laughs> it, it just happens. I can attest to that, yeah. Yeah, like, they love him. He, they think he's great. He's so good with kids. He also used to be a teacher, so it makes sense that he's good with kids. Yeah. But also, like, there's children who live in our neighborhood. They're not coming to our house to hang out with him. No. That's a weird fucking thing to do. That would be very strange. And when we say that they would hang out, like, she would come over and, like, watch TV with them. That, yeah, that's bizarre. Bizarre. Very bizarre. And now like, parents would not fucking allow that. Absolutely not. No. Yeah. No, never talk to anyone unless I'm standing staring at you. Yeah, yeah. go ahead and go, like, live, go hang out with this unmarried couple plus grandma and just in their house unsupervised suspicious very fucking suspicious absolutely not so on december 26th of 1964 henley took her grandmother to one of her relatives houses and then told her that she couldn't come home but that she was going to bring her home the following day interesting strange so like grandma get out of the house you can come home tomorrow from discussing how the two of them acted while they were reading fucking nazi shit in their break rooms at work i can only imagine how fucking awful it was to live with them oh yeah yeah so I'm sure grandma was like, okay, bye. Yeah. Now, on the same day that they dropped off grandma somewhere, Leslie Ann Downey went missing from a fun fair. Let's talk a little bit about Leslie. Leslie's family and friends described her as well-liked, and she just had a shy nature. She would really come out of her shell when she would dance or sing. And her favorite song was called Bobby's Girl. She also loved to roller skate. She had an older brother named Terry and then two younger brothers named Brett and Tommy. Big families. Yeah. Her mom said that she was perfect and had a strong sense of right and wrong. So again, this happened on December 26th, which is the day after Christmas, which from my understanding of places in Europe, like the day after Christmas is also like a big deal. Like we do Christmas Eve here. Yeah. But there it's like the day after. Brady and Henley encountered Leslie while she was alone at the fun fair. When they approached her, they purposely dropped some of the bags they were carrying. And they acted as though they just couldn't possibly carry everything to the car without her. She helped them carry things to the car. And, and then once they got there, they said, like, oh, we just we need your help carrying this stuff into our house, too. And, and you know, she's a sweet young kid. So she's like, OK, I'll come help. And this is where things deviate. All of the other murders that we've talked about thus far occurred at the moor. This is where they actually bring her into their home. Yeah. So once Leslie's inside, Brady and Henley undressed and gagged her, then made her pose for explicit photographs. Ugh. Leslie was sexually assaulted and killed. Um, it's believed that they strangled her with string as well. Henley and Brady recorded the audio from the attack on reel-to-reel -reel audio tape. Both Henley and Brady's voices were heard on the tape along with Leslie's pleas. Henley, however, maintained that she did not take part in the attack or the murder. She said when Leslie was being undressed that she was upstairs and not, not with Brady. When Brady took the photo, she was like, oh, I was looking out the window. I didn't see that he did that. And then Henley said that when Brady murdered Leslie, Henley said, oh, I was running a bath. OK, but your voice is on these things. Yes. Someplace else each time. Yeah. And 
from what I understand, she's basically, she's kind of scolding Leslie on it. Like she's speaking to her unkindly. And Henley's like, oh no, I wasn't trying to be mean with her. I just needed her to be quiet because we had neighbors. I'm like, she's a child who's being attacked. Of course she's loud, you fucking monster. Yeah. Ugh. So after she was murdered, Brady and Henley then buried Leslie at Saddleworth Moor in a shallow grave. And to add even fucking more just disgustingness to this, when they buried her, they buried her naked, but they piled her clothes up at her feet. Monsters. In every way. Yes. In every fucking way. So we're moving on to two months later in February of 1965. So Patricia, the little kid we talked about, stopped visiting Brady and Henley. Probably for the best. Yeah, for sure. Now, Smith kept coming over, though. Brady would give him books to read, and they would also regularly discuss robbery and murder. You know, their favorite fucking topics. Fucking weird. In July of 1965, Smith and Maureen moved closer to Henley and Brady, and the couple saw one another a bit more. Then, on October 6th of 1965, Edward Evans was murdered by Brady and Henley. Unfortunately, we couldn't find much out about Edward. His family was very private. But what we do know is that he was 17 years old when he was murdered. And at the time, he was an apprentice engineer. So, smart boy. Yeah. So, the circumstances surrounding Edward's murder are a little different. Henley drove Brady to Manchester Central Railroad Station in the evening of October 6th so that Brady could pick his next victim. After just a few minutes of being inside the station, he came back out with Edward. He told Edward that Henley was his sister. Creepy. Brady later told law enforcement that he had picked Edward up so that they could have sex. The three of them drove back to their home on Wordlebrook Avenue and drank wine. Brady told Henley to go get her brother-in-law, Smith. So remember, they were having this like weird relationship, chatting about weird stuff, right? Mm -hmm. When they got back to the house, Henley told Smith to wait outside for her signal, which would be a flashing light. After he saw the flashing light, Smith knocked on the door. Brady answered the door and asked Smith if he came for, quote, the miniature wine bottles. Weird. Bizarre. Brady told Smith that he was going to get the wine, and then he left the room. A few minutes went by before Smith then heard a loud, high-pitched scream, one after another. Hindley then screamed for Smith to help Brady. Smith ran into the living room and then froze. Now, he described the victim as a young man, but we know it's Edward, so we're going to call him Edward. He saw Edward facing up. He was laying with his head and shoulders on the couch, but the rest of his body was on the floor. Brady was standing over Edward with his legs on either side of him. Edward was screaming as Brady slammed a hatchet onto the left side of Edward's head. Then Smith watched as Brady strangled Edward with an electrical cord. Could you imagine fucking walking into that and then just watching and standing there? Given that they had had so many conversations about robbery and murder and all these fucked up things, I wouldn't be altogether surprised if I came in and saw this person murdering someone. Although there would be the initial shock of this is actually yeah. happening. This isn't a hypothetical discussion. Right. Brady was so into this that I find I have a hard time empathizing with anybody who was in shock at what he could do because it's like he literally told you how he wanted to do this kind of shit. That's true. That's true. It's just not knowing exactly their conversations. I know we know a little bit of what might have happened, but like just thinking about did he know at this particular moment that's why they invited him over? Was he expecting it? Was it unexpected? Like, ugh. So Brady claimed that he could not lift Edward's body by himself because he had hurt his ankle during the altercation. Fuck him. Mm -hmm. Smith and Brady wrapped Edward in a plastic sheet and then they moved his body to one of the spare bedrooms so that they could dispose of the body later. Brady then instructed Smith to pack any incriminating items into a suitcase. Smith said that he was going to come back the next morning so that they could, you know, together move the body to the car and then they could go to Saddleworth more. And so, again, we're talking about Smith now being an accomplice to this murder and the concealment of the murder and disposal of the body, which, again, based on the conversations they had previously had, you would think that Smith would be up for because he'd been talking about this so much. Right. That was like their favorite topic. Yes. So again, it's October 7th, the night of the murder. Smith got home around three in the morning. Apparently, Maureen was waiting up for him. And he said to her, can you make me a cup of tea? And she does. He drinks the tea and then threw up. And then he also just word vomits everything that just happened. He then waited until it was light out 
and went to the phone box to call police. Because remember, nobody had phones in their house. Yes. So he went to the phone box when it was light because he was terrified that Brady would see him and hurt him. Remember, he moved closer to them. So like they lived around each other. Yeah. And presumably, like there's not a ton of phone boxes. So it's one that he could be around. But so when Smith went out to use the phone box to call law enforcement, he brought a bread knife and a screwdriver. So after he calls police, they sent a car to pick him up and he goes to the Hyde police station. Once he's there, he explained what happened the night before. Law enforcement then went to Hinley and Brady's home where Hinley was the one who answered the door and they ask if they can come in. They're like, sure. When they came in, Brady was writing a note to his employer about his ankle. And the police superintendent, Bob Talbot, told Brady and Hinley that he was investigating a violent encounter that someone said had taken place at their residence. They both denied that anything happened and let the police search the home. So confident. Very bizarrely confident. Eventually, law enforcement came across a bedroom that was locked. Law enforcement asked Hinley and Brady to unlock the door, but they responded, oh, the key for that door is at Hinley's work. And so law enforcement says... Okay, we'll drive you there so you can go get that key. Fair. Because, of course, they're going to continue to search or they're going to break the fucking door down. Yeah. But so at this point, Brady just tells Henley to give them the key. So once they're inside, they found Edward's body and just Brady was arrested. Brady tried to say that things had gotten out of hand and that what had happened was an accident. Why do they always think that that's going to work? Yes. So again, just Brady was arrested. And yet, Hinley was intent on going to the station with them as well, and that she also be able to bring Puppet, again, the dog. Hinley said Edward's death was an accident, but she wouldn't talk any further. So she agreed to come back the next day, so they said she could leave. So she did. She then asked her employer if they would fire her so that she could collect unemployment benefits. Weird. Before Hinley was fired, she picked up an envelope that had been Brady's. And she burned the envelope and claimed that she did not read the contents of it before doing so. Per Henley, she thought that it was bank robbery plans. But like she claims to not have anything to do with anything. But now she's hiding what could potentially be evidence for something else. Also, like, why is he keeping a like an envelope of bank robbery plans at his work? That's a weird thing to do. The other guy we talked about wrote a movie about what he was doing. So like, oh, fucking fuck, man. The thought process isn't there. Yeah. So then just four days later, on October 11th of 1965, Hindley was arrested. Law enforcement charged her as an accessory to murder for Edward's murder. So now we're going to move on to the investigation. While searching Hindley and Brady's home, law enforcement found a book with John Kilbride's name inside. The two had not previously been suspected of the murder, but this made them consider them as a suspect for the murder, as well as other unresolved disappearances. Brady was adamant that he and Smith murdered Edward, but Hindley only did what she had been told when it came to him. Smith told law enforcement that Brady, quote, had a thing about railway stations, and he also told them that Brady would ask him to put incriminating items into suitcases. So that led officials to go check the Manchester Railway Station's left luggage office. So, you know, like when people forget their luggage or it doesn't make it in time or whatever. Here we have Smith saying, clearly, oh, he asked me to put evidence into things. Yeah. So he knew there was evidence. Yeah. So suspicious. Very suspicious. Right. So inside the suitcases that they connected to Hinley and Brady, there was a horrifying amount of evidence and items. So one of those items was a 16-minute tape of a girl who said she was Leslie and she was screaming, crying, and begging to see her mother. They also found pornographic photos of Leslie that Brady had taken along with other photos and negatives. The other photos were seemingly innocent. They included things like Henley at Saddleworth Moor posing for photos, sometimes with her dog. And there were also costumes and notes that they found. This part, this next part just hurts a lot to say, but Police then had Leslie's mother come look at two of the photos, and they were the only ones that they deemed appropriate for her to even see to identify her daughter. She also listened to at least a portion of the audio tape to confirm it was her voice. And I just, I can't imagine that. I know there's other cases that included stuff like this where parents have to listen to it. And it just, like hearing it happen, you know, is different than knowing it happened. It's like hearing it happen like you're there. Mm Mm-hmm. Law enforcement spoke with Patricia, the little girl who hung around Henley and Brady, 
you know, the one that we mentioned earlier, the weird relationship. Mm-hmm. She told them that the pair had taken her to Saddleworth several times. She showed them where they frequented, and police began searching those areas for remains. Smart little girl to, like, be like, this is where we hung out. For sure. What I would also be curious about is whether Brady and or Henley got off in some sick fucking way by bringing a child to the grave sites. Probably. Probably. Also, this girl probably has so much fucking, like, trauma from these innocuous seeming instances Mm -hmm. where she's just a hair from death. Yes. Yeah. It's still like, I know that she lived close, but it's still like, why and how did she get away? You know, like what, what was different? Mm -hmm. On October 16th, they found an arm sticking out from the peat that would ultimately be identified as Leslie. Her mother confirmed that the clothing piled at her feet was indeed Leslie's. Again, just like another layer of fucked up for this poor mom. I know. Smith told police that Brady had bragged about having photographic proof of murders that he had committed. Another weird layer that he would like tell Smith about, right? And you're surprised he's murdering people? You're now go- now going to act shocked and clutch your pearls at this? Like, this guy's telling you fucked up things, that he's doing fucked up things. So then you stumble upon him doing fucked up things and you're shocked? Right. It's hard for me to believe his innocence in this. Well, that's why I'm like, did he know that was going to happen? Because he, you know, like, we don't know exactly Mm -hmm. what they talked about, but, like, we have little snippets, and... Yeah. It seems like he he knew a great deal. So law enforcement, obviously, were like, okay, we need to take a serious look at the areas that, you know, those seemingly innocent photos were taken so we could see if there's anything else. They even asked locals to help identify particular parts of Saddleworth. On October 21st, They found the severely decomposed remains of John Kilbride. His mother had to identify him by his clothing. Ugh. I always feel for all these parents. Yeah. Also on October 21st, Hindley and Brady were charged with Leslie's murder. So that following November, law enforcement kept searching the moor for more victims. But as it got colder, the searches died out. Around the same time, the media dubbed the murders as the Moor Murders. At this point, we just have Leslie and Edward who are connected with them. And there begins to be public speculation that perhaps Pauline Reed and Keith Bennett were also victims of Brady and Hinley. Law enforcement played the recording of Leslie and Brady said that they didn't convince her to come to their home. He said that two men had brought her there and that they had taken her alive from their home so that whatever happened to her wasn't him. In early December, Brady was also charged with John's murder, and Hinley was then charged with harboring knowledge of Brady's murder of John. We talked about, you know, the seemingly innocent photos that included Puppet, and he was in lots of photos all over the place, and he ranged in age from a puppy to a full-grown dog. So law enforcement was like, we can use his age to determine when these things were happening. So they had a veterinary surgeon examine Puppet to figure out his age. For some reason, they used anesthesia for this examination, and he did not wake up. That's sad. Fucking hate that. Yeah. Puppet was a bystander. Yeah. Henley accused police of murdering her dog. Up until this point, she'd really not shown much emotion. So law enforcement was surprised she was so upset by her dog dying. It's really sad. Now... You can look at like teeth and things like that to determine a dog's age. Mm-hmm. So I, I just wonder, like, what was this veterinary surgeon doing to puppet to figure out their age? The only thing I can think of is, you know, as a dog trainer thinking about why would they have to put them under to examine age would be maybe he wasn't allowing them to look at the teeth. Because there are dogs that just aren't socialized well with especially other people if he's not near yes, his owner Mm -hmm. and she's not in the picture. Maybe he was biting or stressed, which understandably, the poor dog. Yes. But I'm wondering if maybe they couldn't check his teeth because I have trained dogs where you were not allowed to touch their face without getting bit. Given how not far along human medicine was in the 60s, I would not be surprised if veterinary medicine was not far enough along to know like dog age from teeth. I don't know. I'm not a dog teeth scientist, but still, it sucks that Puppet died 
But one of the important things here is that this is the first time anybody sees Hinley get upset. Mm -hmm. And up until now, they're like, here's children that were horrifically murdered. And she's like, okay. And she's kind of just neutral about it. Yeah. So let's talk about the trial. It lasted 14 days. And during the trial, both Hinley and Brady were behind bulletproof glass because they were afraid people were going to try to kill them. There was lots of outrage from the public, which fair, fucked up. Yeah. Hinley and Brady both pled not guilty. Smith was the prosecution's primary witness. And the media coverage here was pretty intense. And we're going to talk about some of the, the interesting things that happened during this that I'd never heard of happening in a trial. And it just brought up some like unique concerns. But before we get into that, most of the city's hotel rooms were booked up from people in the media. And there was, you know, the, the courtroom itself, plus like outside was filled up with people who wanted to watch the trial, whether it was media or just people who lived around there. The News of the World newspaper reached out to Smith for the rights to his story. And he eventually agreed to weekly payments of 15 pounds until the trial. And then in their agreement, he would get another thousand pounds only if Brady and Hinley were convicted. And this meant that the prosecution's star witness had a financial motive to testify against the defendants. Yeah. Smith gave statements before and after trial. Presumably, his statements before trial were also before the agreement. So his statements that he made at trial were compared to those pre-agreement, pre-trial statements, and they were not substantially different, which is good. Yeah. But people really disliked Smith because of this. And it was so bad that Maureen was attacked in the elevator of their apartment building during the trial. She was eight months pregnant at this time. Ugh. They also received hate mail and they were worried to let their children out of their sight. Yeah, that sounds really scary, especially for the kids. Like the kids are innocent. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hinley testified for six hours and Brady testified for eight. Fuck. Hinley said that she did not know that the photos of her posing at Saddleworth Moor were on grave sites. But like, come on, you know. Mm, yeah. After the 16-minute tape of Leslie was played, Hinley said that the reason why she was so cruel to Leslie was because she didn't want people to hear her screams. She's going, what the fuck? Yeah. And that she had nothing to do with the pornographic photos, attack or murder. But you're present. Yeah, I don't fucking believe that. And yelling at the victim, you know? Come on. Yeah. So throughout this testimony, Brady was incredibly calm and seemed arrogant. He claimed that while he had hit Edward with an axe, he did not strangle him, so he did not murder him. Like, this guy, all these people we've been talking about lately, I don't understand how they think, like, oh, well, I mean, I did this to them, but, like, I didn't mean it, or... Yeah, yeah. It's just a, a slight murder. Yeah. My guy. I don't understand. Fuck this guy. Yeah, fuck this guy. The jury only deliberated for about two hours before finding them guilty on all charges. The death penalty had been abolished less than a year before. Brady was sentenced to three concurrent life sentences, and Hinley was sentenced to two concurrent life sentences, plus another seven years for her knowing Brady had murdered John. So as an interesting note, the England justice system is a bit different from what we see in the U.S. So the justice that handled the sentencing did life in prison. And apparently at this time, the home secretary could parole someone that the parole board recommended it. This was changed later. Good. This seems like a weird fucking thing that, like, you shouldn't ha maybe have that power. But a weird note. Yeah. In 1985, Brady allegedly told a journalist for the Sunday People that he had killed Pauline and Keith. This confirmed law enforcement suspicions, so they reopened the investigation. When a detective went to speak with Brady about it, he was, quote, scornful of any suggestion that he had confessed to more murders. The police looked at the photographs we discussed earlier again, and Keith's mom wrote to Hinley, begging her to tell her what happened to her son in 1986. Hinley would not confess to killing Keith when law enforcement visited her, but she did agree to look at the photographs to see the areas and if they looked familiar. She showed interest in one area, but she just couldn't quite remember without seeing them more. Hinley was taken to the moor under law enforcement supervision to see if she could remember anything else. Hinley visited the moor twice, and it was a huge endeavor. They closed all the streets to the moor, and there were hundreds of armed officers plus helicopters surveying, which, like, I appreciate that they were making sure that it was all going to go well. Yeah. Ultimately, she did not show them any burial sites. 
The following February, Henley formally confessed to two additional murders, and that was of Pauline and Keith. And it was in a statement that was over 17 hours long. The detective who was in charge of the reopened case, Detective Chief Superintendent Peter Topping, explained that it felt as though he, quote, witnessed a great performance rather than a genuine confession. And like 17 hours is a long fucking time. Yeah. Law enforcement told Brady about Hinley's confession, but he did not believe them until they shared specific details about the murders that only Hinley would know. Brady said that he wanted to confess, but only if they would let him kill himself right after. Obviously, he could not do that. So again, we're in 1987. In February, that's when Hinley confesses. But it's not until April that that confession goes public. In that confession, she also specifies that Smith had no part in the murders other than what she had said happened with Edward. Originally, she had said that he had more to do with things, which is why she basically pulled that back. In subsequent interviews with law enforcement, she described the area where Pauline was buried, and they were eventually able to find her remains. Brady eventually did confess to Pauline and Keith's murders, even though they would not let him kill himself. Brady also was allowed to visit them more to try to help locate the bodies. But he also did not say or direct them anywhere that was useful. He said that he located the burial site, but Keith's body wasn't there. And Keith's body was never recovered. Oh, that's horrible. Despite those confessions, Hinley and Brady were not formally charged with the murders because they'd already been sentenced to life in prison. Like, I get it, but also, like, those poor families not feeling like they got justice. Yeah. So, fast forward to 2003, and the search for Keith's remains begins again. The United States even assisted by allowing them to use some spy satellites to see if they could find his remains. At one point, a skull was located, but it was not confirmed whether it was Keith. Sad. So next, we're going to talk about Hinley and Brady's time in prison through the end of their lives. Hinley attempted to appeal her original conviction and life sentence throughout her incarceration, but luckily was unsuccessful. At one point, she began a relationship with one of the prison guards. Patricia Cairns. This gets wild. Yes. Now, Cairns was eventually arrested when she tried to help Hinley escape. Like, this is like a movie, right? Yeah. Ugh. When Hinley sought parole, she wrote a 30,000 word plea to Home Secretary Marilyn Reese. One portion included, quote, within months, he had convinced me that there was no God at all. He could have told me that the earth was flat. The moon was made of green cheese and the sun rose in the West. I would have believed him. Such was his power of persuasion. So like now she's like, he told me everything and I just believed him. Sounds very Lori Vallow. It does. It's just, hey, I've raped a bunch of kids. Should knock you out of it. Yeah, yeah. It's hard for me to give anyone any empathy. No. When we're talking about sexually assaulting children. I do not care how brainwashed you are. Get fucked. Yes. In the 90s, she said that she didn't want to take part in the killings, and she only did so because Brady was blackmailing her with the explicit pictures he had of her. Also, she claimed that he was drugging her, and because he threatened to kill Maureen. So she had a lot of different reasons, she claimed. We had a lot of excuses here. Yeah. You will survive if naked pictures of you are shown to the world. Mm -hmm. You don't get to hurt other people because you're scared. Yeah. Her attorney, aka her solicitor, shared that Hinley had told him, quote, I ought to have been hanged. I deserved it. My crime was worse than Brady's because I enticed the children and they never would have entered the car without my role. Also, I have always regarded myself as worse than Brady. So he fucking murdered them. She's complicit in that. And because of that complicity, she is equally as fucking guilty. Yeah. But I do think it is interesting that when women commit crimes with men, and the men are the primary aggressor, people will see the woman as being worse, even though theoretically the woman sometimes is not the person doing the actual killing or sexual assault. They're like, oh, because she was involved, it's worse than what they did. It's really fucking bad. But if she just got them into the van, nothing would have happened. Her getting them into the van didn't kill them. Brady killed them. Still get fucked. My point is that I think that people are like, women are mothers and therefore, like, should be maternal to all children. Mm. She's fucking garbage. He's fucking garbage. But he's the garbage that fucking did the thing. I still am not on the side of her not, like, 
taking part of things, you know? Oh, oh, no. I absolutely think she was helping and doing the things. Yeah. Because there's no world where you're either, in my head, bad enough where you're doing the terrible things with a person because you're into it in some sad, weird, fucked up way. Yeah. Or you're disgusted by that. And there's only two options. And you're not going to be cool with somebody else doing that shit if you're not into it. Correct. Waiting in the van while he does this garbage? No, get fucked. Yes. I'm mad about it. Yes. No, agreed. Now, Hinley died in November 2002 of pneumonia. Good. So it wasn't a pleasant death. Karen's, who had served her sentence by this time, spread her ashes in a park that was less than 10 miles from Saddleworth Moor. It's kind of weird, right? Yeah, if I was the partner that was after the horrible fucking thing and this person got me to fall in love with them under the pretense that like, I'm actually a good gal. But then that person was like, but can you go ahead and spread my ashes near where all of these kids were killed? No, I'm going to flush that. I wonder if they even had that conversation. Like dying of pneumonia isn't really expected. Just fucking weird. Yeah. Now let's move on to Brady. Brady never really seemed to feel bad about what he and Hinley did. He did regret the consequences of their actions, but not the murders themselves. At one point, he confessed to additional murders. This was pretty soon after he visited the Moors. The details were sparse. He claims that he killed a man in Manchester, someone else in Saddleworth Moor, a woman whose body he left in the canal, and two people in Scotland. This was not enough to start an investigation, and Hindley claimed no knowledge of the additional crimes. But like, why else would he bring it up if he didn't actually commit these? So it's kind of scary that there's likely more. Absolutely. Brady spent time in mental health facilities and prisons throughout the rest of his life. He was diagnosed as a psychopath. Surprise, surprise. What a shock. During his incarceration, Brady befriended a serial killer named Graham Young, who was dubbed the teacup poisoner. Interesting. So they could talk about murder and robberies, I guess. Mm -hmm. When Brady wrote a book called The Gates of Janus, he discussed his friendship with Young. Bizarre. Mm -hmm. Brady died of restrictive pulmonary disease on May 15th of 2017. So he lived a while. I love to hear that he's dead, though. Yeah. Love to hear it. So we're going to talk about the families of all the victims and the aftermath. Maureen, Hinley's sister, She died in 1980 of a brain hemorrhage. John Kilbride's parents came to the funeral because they thought that Hinley would be there. And their names again were Patrick and Sheila. Patrick attacked someone because he mistakenly thought that she was Hinley. And Sheila said that, quote, that if she, Hinley, ever comes out of jail, I'll kill her. And John's brother, Danny, said the same thing. Because remember, she was trying to get parole. Yeah. Pauline Reed's mother, Joan, was admitted to a mental hospital. She was under heavy sedation at Pauline's funeral in August of 1987. It's horrible. Leslie's mother, Ann West, spent a good amount of time and energy making sure that Henley did not get parole and that she stayed in prison. In 1999, she ultimately died of liver cancer, and her doctors confirmed that the stress and ordeal contributed to how severe her illness was because not only did she lose her daughter, but she was fighting to keep Henley in jail and to not get parole. Yeah. Originally, Anne said she would never go to Saddleworth more after they found her daughter there, but she went right before she died. And she said, what must it have been like for our baby in the dark all alone? In an interview with Anne before she died, she said that she would haunt Hindley for the rest of her life, which fuck fucking right you will. Yeah. In that interview, she also said, I speak to Leslie. I have done so from the night she went missing and I cannot wait to join her. But I didn't want it to happen this way. I wanted Hinley to go before me, actually. Leslie's stepfather, Alan West, died in 2016. In one of his last interviews, when he was 71, Alan said that he still had nightmares about Leslie's death. And in this part, like, equal parts sad and just fucking enraging. After Alan died, Leslie's brother Terry was interviewed. He was angry that Brady outlived many of his victims' family members. And then he also talked about how in 2001, a man named Cass Telfer set fire to the home of Tommy West, who was one of Leslie's brothers, and that in that home, it was Tommy and his eight-year-old daughter, Kimberly, and that they both died in that fire. Teffler set the fire because he was obsessed with Hindley and Brady. I fucking hate people so much. Just what the fucking, like, these families have just lost so much, and for people to 
for that to continue. Yeah. And that for someone to just amplify that pain, it's just, I don't understand. Yeah. So again, Tommy was Leslie's brother, right? And then his daughter, Kimberly. Yeah. But like, they had nothing to do with anything that happened. You know, like, nothing. They they were just family members of someone who got murdered. They did nothing wrong. And then this person's like, hey, I love the murderer who killed Tommy's sister. Let me go kill them too. I don't even, like, my brain doesn't connect, you know? It doesn't, I can't connect those dots. Yes, it doesn't make sense. Obviously, none of this makes sense because your brain isn't working properly if you can do this. But typically, when you hear somebody who is obsessed with a serial killer, it's like their actual victims, not like their victim's family member that's like removed. Yeah. And also, right, we're talking 2001. This is decades after the murders. Right. And so the last family that we're going to talk about is Keith Bennett's. His mother, Winnie Johnson, frequently visits Saddleworth Moore up until her death in 2012 because she believed that's where her son was buried. She estimated that she had visited it thousands of times. At one point, Brady wrote to Winnie and he was trying to get sympathy from her, which fucking rich, but he was also trying to manipulate her into convincing law enforcement to let him go to the moor once more. And Winnie responded to him and said, I want to find Keith before you die. And when you have died, I want to put the first nail in your coffin. When talking about the funeral she wanted to have for him once they found his body, she said that she wanted to make an announcement. And before we get into what that was, she didn't want to have a funeral until they found him. But they never found him. So they didn't get to have that funeral, which like that just it just it's just so fucking bad. But like. She's like, he's here, you know? So she keeps right. going to the moor because that's basically where he's, he's buried, you know? And it's just, it's so fucked up. Well, it's, it's a big space too. Yeah, it's massive. And everything kind of looks alike. Yeah. Ugh. But when she wanted, to, the, the announcement she said that she would have made was, I want to thank everybody for looking after me and helping me rescue Keith. He is my son, but he's the stepson of Manchester as well. Everybody thinks of him and everyone wants him to be found. And not just here. All over the world. When he's found, I know I'll, I've done. Oh gosh. Whew. When he's found, I'll know I've done my duty as a mother. I'll be at ease then. I'll know I've got him back. Which, like, fuck, man. Like, when he got me more than I think any parent that we've ever talked about because it's just heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking that the rest of her life she's looking for her son. Yeah. And just kind of wanting a little bit of closure. I know she knew what happened, but like to be able to close that and she just never got that opportunity. Just this crumb of relief. Exactly. Nothing will bring her baby back, but at least she could mourn him in a way where she felt like she could. I don't have kids, so I know I'll never imagine what it would feel like to lose them, but to lose them in such a terrible way and then to not even get closure. I just, it's fucking awful. Yeah. And I did see... When we were looking at pictures of Saddleworth Moor, that there is like a little area. It kind of reminds me of Chad Daybell's property on the fence line that is dedicated to Keith, where people have left flowers and like toys and stuff. It's heartbreaking. Absolutely. But that was hard. Yeah, this was a, this was a rough case. It took Lindsay and I, I think, two or three hours to get started today because like, yeah, it's an interesting case. And we're thankful that Chloe sent it in. But also talking about this is rough. Right. Yeah. I think it was like three hours that we procrastinated. But it's worth talking about because we should never, ever forget Pauline Reed, John Kilbride, Keith Bennett, Leslie Ann Downey and Edward Evans. And also um, in, in, in our list of family members, we didn't talk about Edward because we don't know much about Edward. Right. They kept to themselves. Yeah, they kept to themselves. And so their grieving was also private. And everyone does this differently. Everyone does it differently. So long as you are not actively hurting other people, there's no wrong way to grieve, you know? Yeah. But, oh. It was a tough one. Yeah. Ends in tears. A tough one for sure. Don't forget them. One of the places that we got some of our information about the victims today was this More Murder subreddit, which we don't normally go to Reddit to find information like that. We'll look for people's like experiences and like kind of talk about those sometimes with things. But that's an excellent subreddit if you're interested in this case or the people who were affected by it. Every year on their birthdays, they post and they, they put a lot about their lives and how their family were affected. So just an interesting little, we don't always talk about all of our sources in the episode. They're always in the show notes, though. Yeah, for sure. Woof. So that was the more murders. Hug somebody you love today. Yes. 
And with that, have a great weekend. Thanks for creeping with us. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes, you, can begin to haunt the dump, guard vortexes, or even become a scorching Sasquatch. Also in our show notes, you can find the link to our website, more information on our sources, our social media handles, and our merch store. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts. I beg of you. (laughs) 